payment of Scali is a composer, yes? And it comes from Baden, where it's through a picture. Um, it's about circumspectral uh, theory and its application with uh, six on the front. Hello? Uh, just in case you're wondering what's going on up there, it's just, I was just having a little fun with the keynote. So it's circumspectral sound diffusion and uh, in C sound. And uh, uh, so first, I'll explain what what I mean by circumspectral. I'll cover the background a little bit. So, so I'm afraid my talk is not going to be very technologically oriented. Although there there will be a little bit of uh, more technical discussion as well. It's just more about how I'm actually composing and how I deal with with space and how I use C sound to realize some of my ideas. Okay, so um, I, I came up with a tool uh, made with CSAM and Max MSB uh, that uh, allowed, uh, allowed, allowed me to create second spectral spaces, which I'll explain in a minute. Uh, but the whole idea for this came uh, when I started working on my first multi channel piece, which, uh, which started off as a six channel piece and then quickly turned into an eight channel piece. Um, and uh, I, I became aware of this, this lack of uh, certain, certain tools for dealing with multi-channel audio or for, for spatial audio. I mean, there's a, there are a lot of tools around for spatialization and panning and so on, but there's not uh, that much going on for more um, experimental approach to spatial audio. So I, I, was, I was really forced to try and design it uh, with C-Sound, which, which I know relatively well. Uh, okay, so in the first part, I'm going to give an overview of my, my general approach to spatial audio and, and describe what second spectral sound diffusion means, which you probably uh, uh, know from all the uh, mailing list discussions. <laughs> and, uh, okay, so. Um, in his 2007 paper, Space Form and Acousmatic and Reactive Image, Dennis Smalley refers to circumspectral spaces as resulting from the combination of spectral space and circumspace. Uh, so it's, it's a combination of, of spectral, circumspace and spectral, basically. And it describes how, uh, how the spectral content of the sound is distributed within the listening space itself uh, to create a sense of what he calls spatial scale and volume. Uh, so this is a quote from Smalley. Uh, how spectral space is in itself is distributed contributes to the sensation of height, depth, and spatial scale and volume. I can create a more vivid sense of the physical volume of space by creating what I shall call circumspectral spaces, where the spectral space of what is perceived as a coherent or unified morphology is split and distributed spatially." End quote. Uh, then he goes on to discuss this in relation to his own compositions. Quote, in my music, for example, Second spectral approaches have been particularly effective in imparting spatial volume to attack resonance spectral morphologies, both to the attack phase and to prolong fluctuating resonance-based forms, giving the impression that the listener is inside the resonance." End quote. So basically the term, this is quite simple, it's just uh, describing the well-known idea of distributing spectral content of the sound around the audience to create a more immersive uh, uh, experience uh, of the sound. But before, before I go on to explain the, the tool and how it works, I think I should just sort of cover the uh, basic background uh, that, that leads to the, the whole notion of spectral space and how it's uh, aesthetically uh, useful. Um, so to do so, we need to, uh, we need to discuss the three main aspects of uh, spatiality and electricity music. So perspectival space, spectral space, and source bundle space. And so I'll just briefly uh, start with perspectival space because it's, uh, it's probably the simplest of the three concepts. Uh, so uh, again, these are three terms coined by Smalley. Uh, 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 pers perspectival space basically describes what he calls quotes, uh, the relations of position, movement, and scale among spectral morphologies or, or sounds, if you like, uh, viewed from the listener's vantage point, end quote. So it's, it's about where where sounds appear to be in listening space and, and the, 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 the scale in relation to each other and in relation to the listener. So it's, it's a visual analogy similar to 
to, uh, so it's, it's, it's all viewed from the listener's point of view. Um, so sacral space is, is, is an aspect of uh, perspectival space because it deals with uh, an expanded panorama. Uh, <laughs> uh, so, so obviously with stereo we, we, have, we have a panorama and you can imagine the panorama can ex extend and it can eventually go, go so surround the listener. So that's, that's the idea of sacral space. Um, Okay, in my own, my own research, uh, music is mainly focused on the notion of spectral space, hence my interest in Victor's amazing opcode. Uh, and uh, spectral space uh, I define as the impression of spatiality as attributed to the continuum of audible spectral frequencies. Uh, so more specifically, it describes the verticality that's, uh, that's uh, perceptually uh, attributed or space uh, in the, in the domain of spectral frequencies, so some sounds are higher frequencies uh, often, not always, but often appear to be actually physically higher up in space, uh, as, as uh, it was actually quite apparent in last night's concert. Um, so it's, it's, the, the, it's, it's more than an, an analogy, it's actually uh, an aspect of, at least in my view, an aspect of the experience of space in, in, in a retractive music, where we can really deal with the spectral domain in a, in a coherent way. Um, Okay, and finally, source bound spaces. Now, I should point out that uh, spectral space is not always pertinent to listening experience. It's always there. Uh, and once you start paying attention to it, you realize it's always there, because all sounds are spectral, obviously. Uh, but it's not always pertinent as far as the actual musical experience is concerned. So, for example, when you have very clearly recognizable sound sources, uh, 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 then uh, spectral space is kind of backgrounded uh, in the listener's mind, and, and we become more aware of the spatiality evoked by the sources itself, the sense of place that the sources themselves evoke. So, uh, if you hear an aer airplane, then it will evoke this sense of verticality, not, not due to spectral space, but just because we associate the sound with, with the sky and, and so on. So, uh, so that's, that's in fact what uh, we can call source bounded space. So, spatiality that's evoked by the, by the sources themselves. Um, in general, sounds that are not directly referential, so more abstract sounds, less source bounded sounds, uh, encourage listeners to follow intrinsic spectromorphological attributes more closely. Uh, and these attributes are, of course, uh, uh, basically the shapes or the, the contours that, that articulate the domain of spectral frequencies. So, in this context, uh, the mental representation of source uh, or, or the imagined source of the sound and spectral morphology itself uh, sort of converge and spectral domain takes on uh, spatial characteristics in our listening imagination. So a spectral domain becomes the dimension that is occupied by the sound shapes themselves. Uh, and this is a process that I've recently come to call autonomization. So the spectral morphology becomes autonomous. It, it's, uh, it's no longer a, a reference. It's no, no longer a, an anecdotal reference, but it's actually it is the source and the sound at the same time. It's a, it's a strange sort of abstract, and I'm going to play an example in order to clarify that. Um, uh, of course, this doesn't suggest that spectral space or spectral spatiality, might be a better term, uh, is divorced from source bounded space. In a sense, we can see spectral space as a as a schema abstracted from certain types of source bounded spaces. So maybe the ver vertical spatiality of spectral domain is heightened by uh, spectral and morphological characteristics that bear similarities with some ecologically familiar sources. So in a high frequency, uh, little sort of small intuitive sounds uh, uh, imitate maybe the sound of certain creatures that we know, or, or maybe 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 there's uh, on a more on a deeper kind of transmodal level, there is some sort of relationship where the behavior of these. Uh, uh, small iterative spectral morphologies uh, uh, evoke uh, the sense of creatures uh, flying around or whatever, whereas lower frequencies are obviously appear heavier and, and they, they move slower and, and they, they fill the space a lot more. So, <coughs> more volume. so, so there is obviously there is a, there's a direct relationship between source bounded space and spectral spaces. Uh, so the, the two can't really be separated. And again, there is of course is a relationship with the spectral space because. Uh, the sense of verticality itself is, a, is an aspect of perspective. So, so these three interact. Uh, it's the, they're almost like the three uh, parts of a very strangely formed coin from a different dimension. 
uh, server. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, there, is a, there is an example, uh, a good example would be in, in Risse, Risse's uh, songs, uh, where uh, right at the end of the piece in the coda section, uh, where um, spectral space is, is, is just uh, is reduced to bare skeletal framework, so you get you get the very low frequencies and the very high frequencies, and everything in the middle is empty, and and you have a drone, very low sustained drone, with this uh, kind of bed-like creature moving about, and and there is perspectival motion. In fact, in the original four-channel piece, it's moving around the audience. Uh, obviously, this is this going to be stereo motion, of that, but still moving around in perspectival space. And it's high up, and um, there is a certain source boundedness about the sound. It does evoke a sense of a bird, a bird like creature, but it's not a bird song. It's, uh, it's more abstract than that. And this is, this is what I would call auto normalization. Uh, so let me just uh, uh, play, play the example. Is the sound working now? Oh, sure. <laughs> So the spectral and perspectival motion of the higher material, plus its intrinsic spectral structure and morphology, uh, clearly outlines a sort of bird-like flight or drift motion behavior. Uh, so source bound and perspectival and spectral spaces work together to create a more vivid sense of spatial height and depth. So here we go. So, so you can see uh, this one single source is moving about, it's, it's uh, moving back and forth as well, uh, and, uh, um, and also sometimes it splits into a, a more textural material, and it's, 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 it's quite an abstract sound, but it clearly has a sense of uh, height due to spectral uh, occupancy and also due to the, the way that it intrinsically behaves as well. Um, so the motion, the spectral motion, is, is, is defined in the sense of space here, partly. Uh, OK, so second spectral space. So now uh, my compositional interest in the light of everything that I've just discussed is pretty clear in, the, in this uh, in regard to the second spectral sound diffusion. Um, similar method is seen in some diffusion systems where different types of uh, loudspeakers are used for the characteristic spectral qualities, such as the uh, GRM Aquismonium, for example, uh, uh, or, or the system they had in, in, in Bush at EMET. Uh, also, we often diffuse acousmatic music uh, on loudspeaker orchestras with overhead speakers, uh, but the signal that's going to the overhead speakers is, is usually filtered, so we, we get just the high frequencies. This just accentuates the sense of height that's already in, in, in the sound. Um, 
Naturally, in a multi-channel context, we have far more control over the perspectival distribution of spectral content of the sound during the composition stage itself. Uh, and so it just it makes sense to utilize that control. Uh, of course, with careful mixing in a digital audio workstation, this can be done, but it, it's, uh, it's, it just seems uh, very appropriate to use uh, something like C sound to, to do that because, because you, can, you, can, you can minimize the amount of manual labor that's, that's done and, and increase the, the number of creative uh, hours, not counting the number of hours it takes to code the CST, of course. Uh, okay, so the idea is to create a tool that allows you to, to sculpt and, and create second spectral spaces in a, in a very intuitive fashion, or at least that's how I work. I don't, I don't like to think too theoretically when I'm composing. You know, I like to have the sound in front of me, be able to mold it and, and, and do things with it and hear the result immediately. Okay, so what are the consequences of this method? Firstly, the conventional notion of spatialization, which I'll get into, I'll, I'll, I'll get into in a minute, so, of sound source within listening space is not strictly relevant here. So, uh, second spectral diffusion involves the distribution of the spectral content of a unified spectral morphology. So one, one sound that's perceived as a unified uh, element um, that is spreading the spectrum of a uniform sound in space. Consequently, second spectral panning is not used to position or move single sources around the audience. Uh, in fact, to a certain extent, the aesthetic attitude that leads to the concept of uh, second spectral space in the first place contradicts the notion of spatial composition as a sort of arbitrary second spatial positioning and movement of input sounds. In second spectral diffusion, perspectival space becomes subordinate to spectral space. Uh, or, or, or better to say maybe that perspectival space is utilized to enhance the intrinsic spatiality that's already in the sonic material. In this sense, space is not seen as an empty canvas or a container or a frame, but it's an intrinsic quality inherent in the material. The, my, my general attitude at the moment is that space is very much like timbre. It's not a parameter. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a multidimensional uh, attribute of sound. So it's just already inherent in the sound. So and often the notion of spatialization views space as a parameter that can be kind of uh, permutated and randomly. And, and, it's, uh, and, uh, I, and not that it, it doesn't work most of the time, but even when it works, I, I think I have certain uh, reservations about that kind of attitude. Uh, so, also in perspectiva, also with, with when you begin to work with circumspectral spaces, you realize that perspectival motion trajectories are automatically formed as a result of the uh, internal spectral motion of the sound. So if you're distributing different <coughs> frequency bands around, around the audience, then, then if the sound already has very drastic uh, motion spectral space, then, then you do get this sense of motion that's, that, that, that's then mapped onto perspectival space. Uh, so by just simply rearranging the spectral elements in, uh, in, in listening space, you can create a sense of motion if you use the right sound for it. So um, uh, here is, a, is an example uh, of, of how you could, for example, uh, configure the spectral frequency. So in fact, I'm using stereo sounds mostly. So the, the, the blue line is the left channel and the right channel there. And, uh, this is just an example, a simple example, of course. So you see the lower frequencies are, are mixed in the front speakers, and as you move back, the higher frequency is coming up to 20 kilohertz. And you can have a linear distribution or a logarithmic distribution. And uh, uh, so you're sending in two channels, two input channels, uh, and they, are, they remain on the left and right sides uh, of the circle. Uh, and so the right channel is distributed the low frequencies there in front and then gradually get into the higher frequencies and the left channel is distributed the same except uh, for just different signals. Is that, is that, does that make sense, the picture? Okay. So um, I've had in interesting results from noise-based sounds that were processed with numerous filter sweep light transformations. And if you process them in such a way that these, these filter uh, motions coincide with trajectories that are inside your stereo sound file, uh, then when it translates to circumspectral spaces, you can get some very strange kind of uh, sweeping effects. Uh, things, things kind of 
warping in a very strange way because there is there is this left right trajectory and at the same time there's up and down trajectory which is then translated to uh, to to the second spectral second spatial trajectory so it's a, it's a very strange sensation but but the right sound material needs to be used of course if you use a sine wave then it's, uh, it's kind of pointless um, Okay, now of course the flexibility of the PVS spectral processing of course in C-sound have always proved useful to me. Uh, and so it seemed like the obvious starting point. Uh, but a note of warning here, because uh, the faithful reproduction of an ori original signal from the data obtained from an FFT algorithm, as you all know, requires all the analyzed bins. So the omission or modification of certain bins, uh, the amplitudes or frequencies of the bins, will introduce more or less noticeable artifacts depending on the extent of, and the nature of the modification itself. Uh, so in this case, we're using amplitude panning, or I'm using amplitude panning, of the individual FFT bins. So frequency data is unaltered. Nevertheless, when you begin to mess about with the amplitude panning, then you're, you're zeroing certain, certain bins in certain speakers uh, and so on. So uh, depending on how, how you're distributing, redistributing these bins in second space, then you can get more, more or less noticeable artifacts. And uh, since I wrote that, I, I, I now actually think we shouldn't necessarily think that these artifacts are bad, because actually I, I know a couple of composers who are using this tool and they, they find the artifacts interesting on a creative level. So uh, sometimes they may, be, uh, they, may, they may be desired, sometimes they may not be desired. But uh, as long as the user knows that if, if you begin to if you begin to randomly distribute bins around, like on this side, then it's, this is going to blur all the transients in the sound. It's going to be very obvious. Uh, whereas this one, where you, you have a sort of contiguous uh, distribution of the bins, then, uh, then the transients are more or less preserved. There is, there is still noticeable artifacts, but it's minimized. Uh, and uh, Yes, okay, so let me just, I'm not going to show you any C sound code because there's no point if you look at the paper and you understand it better, but I do have a little graph, thanks to Ivan's uh, suggestion. Uh, so, uh, just to show you how the implementation works. So we have uh, the input, that's a microphone, uh, which is then uh, goes to PDS, ANO, and, uh, or ANO, uh, FFT uh, analysis. <laughs> And uh, it's then uh, divided into uh, frequency stream and, and, uh, and amplitude, obviously. And uh, then these are written to tables, window by window. So we have a table uh, for frequencies and a table for amplitudes. OK. And this then goes into a UDO, which is the, the core of the CSD, basically, which also takes in a user-defined panning table, which has the same number of indices as the as the amplitude table. So you have one index for, for defining the panning uh, position or mixing, if you like, but, uh, of the amplitude uh, bins, one by one. Uh, and uh, then, uh, according to this panning table, the, uh, the amplitude bins are mixed uh, in between six empty tables. Uh, each one for each speaker, in this case, or eight, if you're dealing with eight channel. So I've now, I've now increased the rate. And finally, we use the same frequency data to resynthesize all these. Uh, <laughs> 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 um, and so, yeah, yeah that's, so it's pretty simple, really. It's really, really simple. Uh, there's, there's nothing fancy about it. I, I, I spent two weeks thinking about it, but when you actually came to, to, to implementing it, it's just, okay, <laughs> that's a big deal. Uh, all right, so now, what can be improved in the future? Uh, uh, basically, we, uh, we could have a three-dimensional uh, vector-based amplitude panel, which would be much more efficient. It would uh, also add another dimension, obviously, so we could work with overhead speakers. It would be very, very useful, although I don't, I don't have that many speakers at home. Uh, I, I'd like the software to be able to, to do that, in case somebody does. Um, an additional spreading parameter where you can control the leakage of each bin uh, to different speakers would be very useful because some lower frequencies don't, doesn't make sense to spread them around just because they, uh, or to distribute them around because they, they can't be localized anyway. So um, 
you might want the lower frequencies to, to just fill the room a little bit more, so it makes sense to spread them more widely than higher frequencies. Um, then uh, I am waiting for the next uh, release of C sound, uh, and Victor has kindly uh, implemented the uh, spectral delay uh, upcode, uh, which is going to be useful because then we can add the correlation to the to the bins as well. As it is, the sound will maintain its unity. So because the brain is basically picking up these spectral uh, elements of the same sound from different different uh, directions and merging it all together perceptually, so you don't you don't hear a segregation. You, what you hear is a sound that has a sense of volume. It's the same source. If you play a cello to it, it still sounds like a cello but it just has a bigger sense of volume plus the FFD artifacts that are added. But if you're careful, you can really minimize those, those artifacts and that's what I try to do. Already. And uh, so it just, it just creates this, this sense of volume. And it's, it's very strange, it also increases the sweet spot because uh, uh, if you're close to one speaker, uh, then your brain is picking up all these elements from different speakers and is merging it all together. So uh, if you're close to one speaker, then you probably it's probably not going to poke in, in your eye, in your eyes in your ears even because uh, because that's not that's that's not the whole signal that's just the part of the puzzle the, the whole signal is recreated in your mind so it's just, it's a very strange effect you can walk around the room and go put your ear next to a speaker and you can hardly hear anything coming out well you can hear something but it's, it it doesn't overshadow everything else so uh, it does it does create a more immersive sense of space but it would be really useful if we could segregate them if you wanted to. If, you, if we could add a little bit of delay to each pin as well as different panning it differently, then, then, then it would actually sound like uh, you're, you're, you're sort of breaking the signal uh, up uh, into different elements. And, and you can do that to varying degrees, obviously, depending on how much delay you do add. So the, the correlation would be useful in case you don't want to maintain the unity of the source. And last but not least, the development of sliding phase recorder uh, uh, would be very desirable because it's, it, it would minimize the artifacts. And as I remember from uh, John's ICMC paper, uh, the, uh, he's, he does sliding, uh, sliding phase recorder is using uh, additive synthesis, resynthesis, as opposed to overlap part. So, uh, so you could arbitrarily change all these frequencies and, and amplitudes without necessarily damaging the phase. And, and also, uh, then you could add frequency-based decorrelation as well. So you could, in fact, add uh, frequency modulation to the different beams as well as panning them differently. So that would be really useful. And as, as obviously you saw from that picture, I'm, I'm forced to use six or eight uh, uh, resynthesis uh, 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 upcodes. Uh, so uh, it's, it's, heavy, it's a heavy duty instrument. And uh, so multi-threading would be really, really helpful. Uh, okay, so just in, in conclusion, the acousmatic, and then I'm going to show the show the interface. Don't worry. The acousmatic space is manifold and is created through the interaction of spectral perspectival and source bounded spaces. Second spectral spaces are born as a facet of this interactive context. So all sounds occupy spectral space which may or may not be perceptually pertinent, depending on the listening context. All sounds suggest source bounded spaces, and all sounds are experienced within the perspectival spatial domain. Consequently, all sounds are by their very nature pregnant with an inherent spatiality. I'm really proud of that analogy, that's metaphor of pregnancy. Um, uh, it is my view that oh, oh, uh, that there is far more to the composition of space and spatial thinking in general in acousmatic music than source localization and movement within listening space, often referred to as a spatialization. Now, there's nothing wrong with that. That's definitely a part of it, but it's not the whole picture. And to reduce the whole of spatiality to just that, I think is a very simplistic attitude, although that obviously is very important when it comes to it. Uh, so, uh, although such technology is needed for spatialization uh, and is highly valuable, from a compositional stance, the notion of spatialization can potentially lead to a simplistic and sterile aesthetic approach that neglects the inherent spatiality of sound. Hey. It is the understanding of this. <laughs> 
inherent speciality and our perception of it that must guide the composition of space in acousmatic music. One could even go as far as to suggest that it's the power to create speciality that makes acousmatic music, or acoustic music in general, as a, uh, marks it, sorry, not makes it, as a unique form of artistic expression. So we need more technological tools and research that enrich our ability to explore and sculpt sonic speciality in an aesthetically sophisticated manner. Okay, so uh, obviously ideas, questions, very welcome, but before that maybe I should just show the uh, interface of the, of the tool. Uh, the interface is made with Max, all the sound is, is, is done in C sound, so there's almost, well, there's actually no sound being produced in Max. Uh, MSP. Okay, so uh, it's actually part of the, the effect tools package, which is just something I created for my own compositional use. Uh, This are called the circumspect. <laughs> it's a bit big on the screen, but uh, maybe I can change the resolution. Okay, so, how does it work? It's a bit convoluted and I, I'm, I'm really open to suggestions because the interface of this particular module is very convoluted and it sort of just evolved out of nowhere, so I'm not happy with it. But it does the job for now, and I've just got to compose for now. But uh, uh, basically here, it's, it's a bit, it's kind of similar to the GRM to warp because you need to be able to control globally what's happening with the you can't go one by one and adjust each value because the, the volume that would be really annoying. So here we have the uh, spectral space, so that's that's frequency is, is vertical, and the, the y-axis is the panning position. So zero would be uh, speaker, uh, zero would in fact uh, be uh, there, then one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and back back to uh, that, and then. For the other channel, for the left input channel, zero would start there. So you could reverse the image as well and go full circle if you wanted to. So uh, if you wanted the higher frequencies to be panned, uh, say, towards the back, uh, and this is a stereo, so it takes stereo input, so everything is mirror, mirrored. So the, the right and left are in reverse. Uh, so uh, if you start, say, at 0.5 here, on the lower frequencies. That means that the lower frequencies are going to be uh, uh, mixed equally between between the front two speakers. And then you can move this uh, all the way up to, let's say, so we have zero, one, two, uh, one, two, three, three point five or so, right? Would mean that the uh, higher frequencies are going to be so the pan equally between, with six speaker set up, pan equally between the rear channels. Uh, and so you have the right input going like this and the left input going like that. So the, the low frequencies would join in the middle and the high frequencies would join in the back. Uh, and you can create curves as well if you, if you want to do, just alt quick. And, uh, and you can change this to an eight channel configuration uh, needed, which is what I'm using now. But this doesn't actually do anything. You need to you need to write these values to one of these four tables. So I, I press one key here, and then command one to write the left channel. So you can have different curves for left and right channels. It doesn't have to be the same. Uh, and now you can see that uh, you, know, you can see that down here. This is what's actually happening. So this is the final table that's actually controlling the. And these are these faders. There are all the submitters that show the level. In fact, if I just load in a stereo sound, we won't be able to 
hear what's going on, but it's very new job that's in here. The Well, obviously, because we're not doing it very drastic, it is just sound like filtering for now, just because we don't have all the other speakers to fill in the gap. Uh, but what you can do also is generate more statistical kind of random values. So let's say if you want a uniform distribution or different for left and right, you just place those. And you can also have a scattering way. Right? you want to bring out the phasing artifacts that might be useful. There is also, uh, so this statistically, you can there's a masking function as well. So you can define, uh, for example, if you want the pins to be mostly concentrated in the center of the, of the uh, panning space, if you like, you can create a curve like that. And now, if I press that, you see that they're concentrated in the middle. If I put a scatter on, you see better. That is more, it's a more kind of Gaussian-like uh, distribution. You can make that more drastic by making the curve more drastic. Something like that. Can you see that? Yeah. A and uh, there's also a masking function that can then further transform the. By the way, there's linear and two different logarithmic distributions as, as well. Now, the nice thing is that there is this little morph option here. It's not actual morphing, it's interpolating between those four tables. So what you can do is by moving this. Uh, you can, uh, and you can see that the distribution changes in these. Uh, Six speakers because it's on the six configuration now. If I put it on. And if you wanted to change the volume separately, you could, you could do that as well. Uh, and obviously, you can control all the effective parameters and all that. That's, that's that. Thank you very much. tools keep getting better and better and when anyone asks me why do I want a Macintosh when I could have a Linux box or whatever I say well you can't use PMON spectral tools without a Macintosh um, it's an excuse to own a Mac and uh, your work has been amazing and I love the thing that you shared today and I wouldn't mind you elaborating on it the concept of thinking of space like timbre rather than a parameter that's genius I love that. I, I worked with Roger Reynolds for years. He's a very big spatial motive guy, sound space. And if you would just elaborate for a second on, <coughs> on your thoughts about space as a, a component more like timbre, mm -hmm. like the essence of the sound. Yes. I'm going to be talking about that for a long time now. So I thank you for that thought, oh, too. Well, thank, thanks for the thought. Well, your work's amazing. So thank you. thank you. Thank you. Well, I, we can we can also chat about it uh, later as well because it's quite a big, big Good. topic. Good. I want to talk about it for a while. Okay, great. So, but um, and this is the other thing that you show here. You look how beautiful these interfaces are, and that's because he's using the display tools and all the enveloping tools from Max. And wouldn't it be nice to have displays like this in C Sound or in Cute C Sound so that everyone could have your tools, let's say, if, if you had an interface builder that was... That's a very good point, actually, because uh, I've, I did look at PD, and the interface building in PD is, unfortunately, not as sophisticated as it is in Max. Uh, so I, I am still considering porting everything to PD, but it's not going to look uh, so polished. Uh, 
And uh, so that's a very good point. I'd love to see tools, some sort of interface building tool for CSAM that allows you to edit and display tables. I think that's the most important thing. Table maker. Table maker, because, uh, because, and also you want to be able to change the distribution, you want to be able to do logarithmic viewing, uh, uh, exponential, and, and also and change the scaling, and, and be able to zoom in and out, because here you can also, here you can also zoom in and out uh, the tables, so if you have many points and you want to be detailed or uh, editing, then you can use that. So, we really need a tool like that. CSAMS, Interface seems to, it's so far been, I mean, a lot of the stuff that goes on with CSound is, is taking on the kind of traditional attitude of orchestra score thing. Uh, and, you know, every now and then you tweak some parameters. But I think there's, obviously there's much more that can be done with CSound. And, but we do need interface, interfaces for it because it's just such an abstract thing to, to try and distribute, uh, you know, like, the D bins around or do things like that, that you really need to rely on the interface. I'm, 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 I'm kind of glad that John is not here. Because he <laughs> 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 uh, uh, did you use a new tool called Stanley? I did, yes, yeah. yes, I, I did look at it. It looks really nice, uh, actually. So this one works on, on many tools? Uh, yes, the, I, I did play around with it. There is no table editor. There is a, there is, it's the OSC tool, right? Uh, I think it's in early text development. Yes, maybe yes. In the yes. But the thing is that, again, that's, it's not something you would use to build interfaces. This is a composing tool. Mm -hmm. And, and it, does, it does imply a certain way of working with the, with the material. So, so I We're really talking interface builder in interface a way. Interface builder. Huh? Yeah. It's, it's a, if you could make an interface and then just release this as a standalone or, or standalone interface like you can do with Max. Uh, that would be really nice. Uh, Our widgets are a step there. They're a step in that direction. But we're really missing these more, you know, this essential widget. Yes, QC sound is, 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 is getting there. And, and I've, I've spoken to Anders about adding a table editor. And he's on to it, or he says, uh, anyway. But I can imagine this thing's take, take time to so, and regarding your, your question about the uh, spatial uh, in, inherent, well, I, I, inherent spatiality of sounds, I, I think that uh, uh, even if you take a mono signal and you play it, it still has space, uh, there's spectral space and there's source bounded space in there, and there's still the spectral space in there because you can perceive the depth as well. So, uh, and I have no problem with moving sounds around the audience. Uh, the, the thing is that uh, I, I think as a composer I'd like to be guided by what kind of spatiality does the sound suggest to me and then bring that out and, and, and emphasize it and sculpt it around as opposed to just uh, uh, arbitrary permutate uh, spatialization parameters. As, as you know, so I think the misunderstanding is kind of similar to uh, Schoenberg's uh, notion of timbre as a parameter, and 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 we haven't still dealt with space as n not being a parameter. We still, it's quite a conventional attitude that we still have, I think. So I think. But I think the, the the perspective you bring might be an insight that that. Um, that serious sound designers maybe always shared and acousmatic composers have always shared, whether they articulated or not, is yes. their sense of the body of the sound. You know, yes, this absolutely. full quality yeah. of the sounds that they're composing yeah. with and not just that they're a collection of notes. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. There's actually, there's a, there's a very interesting passage in one of the, um, um, Bottler's uh, essays on Wagner's Neuen Green, uh, and he talks about uh, his experience of the first time he heard the overture, the Neuen Green Overture, and he talks about how Wagner paints space and spatiality, and it's amazingly musical, and it's, uh, it's like reading a description written by some charismatic composer, and so it's, it's already there in conventional instrumental music, and people have been dealing with it intuitively. It's just, as you said, it's not, uh, we don't have the taxonomy to discuss it theoretically. And I think that you're right about this mistaken idea. 
you know, there are these simplifications mm -hmm. that, it, you know, I think it's a confusion that leads down a path that, that uh, then we blame it on the sound system, the hall, yeah. rather than our conception of how to compose in space, yeah, exactly. which is a wrong one. Mm -hmm. It's not a note. Yes, yes, absolutely. You know. Yes, if I get that, I think your spread factor could be positive. Do you mean the idea the spread? Yes, 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 absolutely. Yeah. I think that's, that's crucial. Yes, actually, Andres, Andres is now working uh, on, his, on his PhD in, uh, in, in Belfast uh, uh, at SARC, and he's working on a similar method. As he's, he's doing the um, partial tracking analysis and then uh, adding the correlation to the partials to, to, to change the perceived. Uh, Spread mm -hmm. of the source itself. So it's not it's not the spread of the panel, but it's it's not amplitude panning, but actually mm -hmm. changing the dimensions of the perceived source, perceptually, uh, in a perceptually relevant way. Mm -hmm. And uh, he's, he's he's told me it works. And I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing the results. But we can only deal with certain types of sounds because they're all. Um, yeah, uh, uh, he's using the partial tracking algorithm. So if, if you have a very noisy brick spectrum, then you can't you can't really use that. Problem. should have an announcement of the workshops uh, around 11, shortly before 11. So Max is not here, but Richard's of course there, and uh, Rory. <laughs>